Turn your Bibles to John chapter 3 if you need it. They'll throw it up on the screen. But I'd like all of you to stand together with me. They say it's the most famous verse in the Bible. They say it's the most recognized verse in the Bible. It has been in every NFL game for more than 50 years. And yet it may be, quite frankly, the most misunderstood verse in the Bible, the most uh, over and under translated verse in the Bible. And it is the great uh, staple of the Christian Christmas. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, bless the reading of your word. Bless every family here that's today and all the families that can't be here today. So many still sick, so many that are compromised in, in their health, and, and so many, Heavenly Father, that uh, just can't get here. And Lord, for those who are watching today on the broadcast, the, the YouTube or Facebook, I pray that you'll bless their families and their home and their obedience to the word that they have. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you and be seated. From the cradle to the cross, we've been talking about for three weeks, and we'll finish up one more week uh, next week out of John chapter 3 as well. From the cradle to the cross, Jesus embodied the three Christmas words. You can see them by the cross. The first one is that of joy. Joy. The book of Hebrews says, For the joy that was set before him, joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the Father. For the joy that was set before him, he endured. That must be a theme for every believer today. For the joy that is set before us, we have to endure. We have to keep going forward in our life. Does not matter. Who's going to say what on the news tomorrow? We know as believers we have to keep moving forward. There's no such thing as a backup or a sit down in a believer's life. We have to keep moving forward. And there is joy that is set before us. But the thing about this joy is the world wants it really bad. And so they try it with bars. They try it with liquor. They try it with drugs. They try it with a free sex lifestyle. They try everything in the world. But we know in our heart, the only thing that produces joy is a surrendered heart to Jesus Christ. That's the only thing because even though uh, some of you may be sad today because Christmas brings as many sad memories as it does glad memories. And did you know that's a good thing for you? Uh, there are certain smells that I, that I pick up the moment I smell that I go all the way back to the little house living with my grandparents. And, and I can see it Every, every inch of it, I see every bit of it, just from the smell. So there are, there are uh, uh, smells that trigger. There are sights that trigger. There are songs and that, that trigger even a sad emotion. But for the joy that is set before us, we understand that we need it. Listen, if, if you were happy all the time, um, well, people would think you're nuts anyway or you're on something. But the other, that's God-given emotion as well so that we can understand and recognize joy when we see it. So the world wants it, but for the joy that is set before us, we endure the things that we go through now, understanding that there is better to come. And so for the child of God, our message this Christmas to all the world is turn off the news, turn off the, all, all of the ridiculous things that are going on, turn off Congress, turn off Senate, send them somewhere, get them out of session so they can do no one any harm. But get for heaven's sake, a place to where joy can be secured. You see, joy and happiness are connected, but it's hard to connect them because sometimes I have joy in my heart, but I don't necessarily have a happiness going on. So it's difficult to connect to joy. And sometimes it has to be with the simple truth. As Jesus looked at the cross for the joy that was set before him, he endured it. Part of your life is simply an endurance test. It's not all fun and games. And that's the problem with modern t television Christianity. It's, it's made to appear as though this is just one big party every time we get up and breathe. And we know better than that. There's no reality to that. So that's the first Christmas word Jesus embodied, who for the joy that was set before him endured. Now, I don't know what you're enduring. Now, I'm not talking about relationships and marriage. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is situation situation, situation, circumstance, circumstance, circumstance. Uh, yesterday I married a sweet couple and it, 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 it could not have gotten any worse. The groom got 
sick after the reception or after the uh, rehearsal and the rehearsal dinner. Then he gets down. He gets sick, goes to the hospital. He tests COVID positive. Uh, the, the place that was catering it all at the country club afterwards, uh, they shut him down. They gave all the food to the policeman. The bride didn't even get to wear her dress. They just came. We locked the church doors and I married them. His family is from Mexico. They had airplane tickets and, uh, and we sat there with everybody outside. We did a private service. And when I got there, the only reason I bring that up is because they're going to hear this as well. But the reason I bring that up is when I got the call and we tried to figure everything out, what we're going to do, and it settled on this, I walked in expecting long, long faces, anger, flowers everywhere, a white wedding dress that was just out of this. Can you imagine that? And your reception dinner over there, all cooked, all ready for 150 RSPV guests that already said we'll be there. And you give it all away and you shut it all down. So when I got there to, the, to that room, there they were sitting, sitting, and they were laughing. They were talking about it. And I walked in thinking, I'm going to have to really pull out a preacher thing to get everybody jacked up. And I sat down, and they had me smiling and laughing about three minutes. Who, for the joy that was set before me, endure the situation. It didn't affect their marriage any. It did affect the situation they're in. Think about the endurance that you must possess. Think about Jesus, the stages of the cross. You, you know, physically, he couldn't make it. He, he'd already been beaten so many times, folks, that he got down in the middle uh, of what is now called the Via Dolorosa, and he couldn't make it. The cross went down. Now, at that point, do you say, do you run up to a Jesus who's on both knees, 150, 200-pound cross beam on his shoulders, and say, Listen, Jesus, for the joy that is set before you, you need to endure this. No. But one was called alongside Simon, and he picked, the, he picked the cross up. Physically, Jesus had reached his limit. I even believe that in the garden, what his prayer was, Lord, if you don't stop this now, the, the weight that's coming because of the sin that's upon me, I won't make it to the cross. Physically, I'll die before I get there. So he prayed. Simon came. And Jesus endured for the joy. But do you read the last part of that verse out of Hebrews? And is now set down at the right hand of the Father. See, it's going to be okay in the end. The second word that Jesus embodies is that of peace. Peace. We've talked about it last week. That was the second word of the, of the Christmas words, peace. In Jeremiah, the, the false prophets and the politicians were screaming, Oh, it's all right. It's all at peace. It's all good. And Jeremiah looked at him and screamed back, you scream peace, peace, when there is no peace, and we know it. And we're, listen, we weren't born yesterday, right? We, we do understand we have a mess in this country. What produces peace is not a good government. What produces peace is good families that start in their home with the understanding that only God can create a joy and a peace in our heart. Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have, finish it with me, peace with God. That's the only way it comes about. If you're listening to me this morning and you have never, ever surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ, you have never confessed your sin to him, you are not saved, you need to confess that sin today. You say, but who are you to set in judgment? Oh, I am nobody. I am nobody but a sinner saved by grace who is now a saint of God. But if you confess your sin, that's where peace comes from. Did you, did you ever get to the point that you just say to someone else, Listen, i got to get this off my chest. I need to say this so that peace can come back. We need to be to that point. And that's what you have to do with God. To make peace with God is to tell on yourself. How many of you had brothers and sisters growing up and you loved to tattle on them? Anybody? Janet, I could see that about you. <laughs> Mama, Mama, Bubba. It, it, yeah. I'm the middle child. We got blamed for everything. Amen. I've said it, Bo, there we are. Firstborn gets bragged on everything. Secondborn gets caught all the junk that everybody else confessed. And the third one is the baby one, and he gets all the stuff. All right, I'll do the preaching. Y'all just do the listening. Peace with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Do you got it? Some, some got it, some ain't. 
I have the peace of God this morning in my heart, not because of anything I've done, any achievement I've ever made, any name recognition or whatever. I have peace with God because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, which is. And some people uh, say his work is not finished. Well, I, I'm talking about the blood shed upon Calvary. That's finished. He'll never do that again. Peace with God. There's nothing like it in the world. Because you see, that's why the world keeps hammering for more. We need more information. We've got to have more information. We've got to put this thing together because we don't know where it's going to go. That's why they worship the, the creation. That's why they're worried about the whales. That's why they want to get the straws. All of these worries, one thing after another after another, simply because they have no peace with God and no peace of God. The third word is that of love. And that's our, that's our talk for this morning. Love. Love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want to tell you three things about this love. Now, if you look at the little word in there, so, so, uh, the word so is used many different times as, a, as an adverbial phrase. Like, oh, I love you so much. So much. That's so and so. See, every, every time an adverbial phrase, it can mean whatever you want to mean. That is not what this is saying. For God so loved the world. It's not so much, and he does, but that's not what it means. There's a little word called hutos in the Greek, and that it means in like manner. Now, in like manner, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's greatest attribute, and that's the first thing we'll tell you, God's greatest attribute is love. Oh, some would say, no, I beg to differ. It's justice because after all, that's, that's what we're all after, social justice. There's a generation of preachers, if they do not get past this social justice junk, uh, saying that these people have been wronged. Listen, everybody has been wronged. I have been wronged. You have been wronged. We can't provide reparations for everyone who's been wronged or we'll all just be swapping money all day long because we just keep wronging people. There, there are Indian reservations that I've been to in South Dakota, in Arizona, that are still living 180 and 200 years after they were wronged. And uh, when you look at it, they're all dying cultures. Their language is dead. Their young people have no hope. They were wronged, and they're still being wronged. And yet, uh, reparations and social justice, everyone is saying in the, from the young pulpits in America, all through the younger politics, this is social justice. We must pay. Uh, the great, great, great grandsons of a slave must receive $100,000 or, or, or acreage or something uh, so that we can say we're sorry. And that's why there's an entire movement to, to shut down the Star Spangled Banner, to shut down uh, the, the National Anthem, to shut down everything that says to us of who we were so that we can build a new who we are. Listen, I am telling you the love of God supersedes all the this junk. For the love of God, for the love of God, we are not only redeemed, but we have a way to live in this life that's a whole lot better than how we did live. If you were like me and saved as a child, um, I mean, I would like to tell you, and one, when I was a student pastor years and years ago, we didn't call them then, we called them youth directors then, but I was one for a long time. And then I did it so long that I said, I, I need to quit and go get an honest job. I mean, because, I mean, that, that if you're a student pastor, that's a tough gig. I'm just telling you right now. And I did it for years. But anyway, I brought a guy in one time because he was known all over the country for his testimony. And the first 20 minutes of his testimony was how bad that he was. And we actually had to stop him in the middle of his message and say, please don't tell us any more bad. Our kids have not even heard what, what you know, you're telling too much bad. We actually stopped him from talking. And said, and, and of course, when he, when he was finished, they applauded and they bought all of his tapes and all of his book. And I'm thinking, you know, a kid like me, how do I build a testimony? I need to go get on some drugs. Uh, you know what I'm saying? When we're saved as a child, we don't have this wild past uh, that we have. But all of us have this in us, in, in, in our background. And it is the love of God, regardless of how bad you were or how late you got saved, it is the love of God. So, um, let me talk about three things. The greatest attribute that God has is love. Now, if you read the Old Testament, there was a lot of time that God's love turned into some wrath. I mean, destroying cities. There was a lot of times that God's love turned into anger. But you see, love is the primary uh, ob objective and the primary emotion of all life. Did you know... Uh, for instance, about you, you'll see all the commercials about dogs and cats anymore. Have you gone to the store lately and seen 
that uh, if you look on the flour and baking aisle, how small it is, go to the dog food section. There are now three aisles complete of dogs, the clothes, dog shoes, cat nips, everything, cat, cat clothes. Uh, why? Because we have a culture that does exactly what Romans 1 says. They will worship the creation more than the creator. But uh, if you love your pet, uh, you're always talking to them, right? I mean, if you don't love them, you just kick them and you don't talk to them. And did you know that after Christmas is the, the largest time for city impoundments and, and uh, shelters and all because they'll get puppies and dogs and they find out there's a lot of work and a lot of mess involved and they go to the pound two to three weeks after Christmas. Thank God when he saw how big a mess you were, how big a mess, uh, that he didn't kick us back to the, pump, to the pound. God's love has kept us. God's love has secured us. That's the number one attribute of God, his love for us. Uh, Romans says it like this, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even in my sin, not after I got cleaned from my sin, but in my sin. God's greatest attribute is his love. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and kind, it shall forevermore endure the saints' angels' song. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and kind, it shall forevermore endure the saints' and angels' song. Do you hear that? It's going to endure. It will keep you as you are enduring in this problem or this crisis, this situation, till the end. Second thing about God. For God so loved, hutos, in like manner, he loved me. The second word is God's greatest gift. Now, we're just a couple of days away from gifts and gift giving. And I love to give and I love to receive. But it is more blessed to what? To give than to receive. I said kiddingly about five or six weeks ago that I called a break on hunting this year. Just don't have the time. And I said, would it kill some of y'all to bring a little? Please don't bring any more deer meat by. <laughs> I just got the cap today, and I'm ready to go. Now, it'll be gone. But what I was thinking after the new year, after I finished my last batch, ribeyes would be good. And it's more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Amen. Now, you know I'm kidding. Kind of. Oh, listen, God's greatest gift is Jesus. You can't divide. You can't take Jesus out. You want to hear a question I was asked this week? And I get a lot of questions, email, a lot of questions, text, messages, I message people all the time. I have no idea who you are or where you're from. Here's the question. I need for you to help me answer it. How can God have a son, Jesus, when he didn't have a wife? That's where I started because he's God. But did you know, uh, according to an NBC nightly news report in 2011, they had a young lady or, or lady on there who was from Harvard and Yale and had found antiquities over in Syria that proved that God did have a wife. CBS, I mean, NBC ran the special. Go back, check it out, 2011. It was flash news. God did have a wife, Asherah. And you know, in the book of Kings, Asherah, the Asherah poles, because it was proven that they actually worshipped Asherah, which was a, a sexual god of fertility, a feminine god. So they hooked those two gods together. And you remember that one of the prophets in 1 Kings tore down all the Asherah poles, and so, see, for the world, and this is why I bring it up in that question, your, your question is not that it's a bad question. It's just that the world cannot accept anything by faith. So if, if God is going to work for me, he has to have a wife because biologically I can't have a child uh, with, without a father. And so uh, the world cannot understand faith. God's greatest gift to us, now lay that aside for a moment because he is God, and he put... Uh, the, the uh, Trinity seed in a, in a beautiful young Jewish girl to have this baby. His greatest gift is Jesus Christ. Can you imagine on, the, on, on that first night of hearing it, and we're going to look more at that next week so we don't go too far, 
all of the confusion that reigned around this announcement from Gabriel. You're going to have a baby. Excuse me. You see, and that's why the question came this week. How can I have a baby? I haven't had physical relations. I just can't have that. So you can imagine all the confusion. Then you can imagine her husband. Ladies, how would you try to convince your, your boyfriend that this has happened? You see what I'm saying? So I understand the questions because if you can't, if you can't produce faith into, a, into the, the, the being, then it's not going to make sense to you. And it doesn't make sense to you until you come by faith. And that's why I have no trouble at all believing that Noah put all those animals on the ark. They got up there. It rains due to do. 140 some days later, they're off the ark. Why? Because by faith, I believe God can do anything he chooses to do. I, I think by faith. And that's why this um, uh, idea that the Catholic Church calls us the immaculate conception. And it is. I mean, it is. You can't worship that conception or worship Mary for being in it. But it is an immaculate thing. But why? Because it's never been done. And it will never be done again because he is God. God's greatest gift is his love. Now, the last word, God's greatest promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God's greatest attribute is love. God's greatest gift is Jesus. That whosoever believeth should not perish, but have everlasting. God's greatest promise, God's greatest promise is eternal life. He's promised us a lot of things, but that's the crown jewel. Someday, this earth, this life will be over. Brother Benny did a graveside service yesterday in a cold and lonely cemetery with very few people there. And some people go out that way. I've done many, many a funeral standing with just two or three people. I, I, I stood at a national cemetery one day with a veteran that had so many service ribbons and stars. Three people were all that showed up. And the little service was over, and I'd listen to the bugler play that taps about 50 yards away. And, it, it, and if you've ever heard that, and I know you have, it breaks your heart to hear it. But death is going to come. It may be alone. There, there are people dying in these nursing homes all over America completely alone. I've heard two stories already today about family, family members in a hospital, and nobody can get to them. Nobody can see them. I think we're making horrible mistakes with this. I think our medical field has, has forgotten that one-third of the healing element is that of touch and feel and encouragement and emotion. But that's what the, this COVID fear has done to even the people who are smart. God's greatest gift is Jesus. God's greatest promise to you is, I will see you in heaven. And you see, I, I would like to rate righteousness. I mean, if you're going to rate righteousness, there's Wayne and Jennifer. I would, okay, we're going to rate him. He's, he's a, he's a 7.8 righteous guy. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we're going to over here and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna label James over here. Well, all right, 6.9. Uh, okay, see, if, if, this were, if this was how it worked, my goodness, what a mess this would be. Because we'd all be fighting for who's more righteous. Like the stars. I want to be the star. I want to be the star. But the, the fact of the matter is, all of Wayne's righteousness is just as filthy as mine. All of James's righteousness is just as filthy as mine. And this, this, this whole concept of a better righteous person are, than you are is absolutely a man-made concept. It's a man-made idea. We're all sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, I can't look at you and say, you know what, I, I, I know about your sin. Because all you have to do is turn around and say, hey, listen, I know about yours. And you can lie about it whether you do or not. It'll shut the conversation off, I promise you. <laughs> because we all want to be found righteous. We want to be, and we love that attaboy, way to go. But that's not God's promise to you. God's promise to you is eternal life. Now you're going to die. You're going to die. Listening to me today on the television, you're going to die. Are you ready for that? Because his greatest promise, and I love a promise, don't you? I hate to make promises because I'm bound then. If I say it, we're going to try to do it or, uh, or die trying. Promises are promises. Now, God's greatest promise then is not it's all going to be okay now eternal life for you. Thank God for his immaculate birth. And there were shepherds abiding in the fields and 
You know, we put the wise men over here with the manger scene. All traditional manger scenes are that way. But we know, according to the Gospel of Matthew, that they were a year late. They didn't even get there. That's why Herod had to change the, the, the kill ratio. He had to say all baby boys born from this time till this time because the, sh- the wise men were a year late following the, the star, trying to, trying to get zeroed in. So technically, no, they were not there. They're, they're a year away because it says they found him in the house. But regardless, they did find him. They were, they were given a star, and they found him. Now, they're saying to us in a couple of days, that star is going to return for the first time in 600 years. And uh, I'm going to look for it. I, I hope that it's there. But whether it is or whether it's not, I know it was there then. And I know that God's greatest promise is not about the star. His promise to you and to me is when this life is over, for the redeemed, you have eternal life in heaven. I wish we knew more about it. I wish we could tell you more. I wish I could understand how, how streets of gold work. I wish I could understand um, you believe in God, believe also in me. I've gone to prepare a place for you and that where I am there you may be also. I, I would love to understand where that place is. I would like to know if there's a, like am I on the ninth floor? Is there a master suite? Is there a presidential suite? Anything or what? What is this place? And then as Pastor Benny said a moment ago, anywhere Jesus is is, is the place. So that won't matter. But I wish I knew more. I think that God did not intend for us to know more about that place than we need to know about this place today, how to live today. God's greatest attribute is his love. God's greatest gift is Jesus himself. God's greatest promise to you is, listen, you trust in me. Someday you will live forever. Have you trusted him? Are you living for him? Right where we are, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Trusting Jesus Christ, coming to, coming to grips with yourself. And you know what? Maybe this is the day you need to make peace with your past. Often when I'm counseling, people will say, Sir, if you just knew what I've done. And I said, the Lord does know. The Holy Spirit already knows. That's why we're here. I don't need to know. If you just knew the stuff I've done. I'm not worthy of salvation. I'm not either. Neither am I. This is the next to the last Sunday of 2020, and I keep hearing from everybody. I heard it at least five times last night. I can't wait to put this year behind me, and I'm starting to get a really bad feeling for everyone that's doing that because I really believe it's going to be an extension of the same. We just get new calendars. So I'm saying to you, if your hope is in that Oh, well, two more, two more Sundays and we're out of this deal. We got a whole new start. The whole new start only comes in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man, woman, boy, or girl is in Christ, he is a new creature from that moment on. Trusting Jesus Christ is your Savior. And I'm sure everybody in this room uh, more than likely has, has prayed those words, has confessed that sin, and has asked Jesus to allow them to be in the kingdom, to have eternal life. I'm sure of that, but there are many watching that have not, and there may be one in this room that has not. But every one of us in this room have family that are in a really tough situation, friends that are in tough situation. And I want to use our altar time, as we say every week, not only to to confess our sin, but to pray for others. Jesus said the number one thing about a church is that they what? Pray, pray, and pray. Our number one defense in in the world system that we're living in is to pray, to pray, to pray. As we stand together with our heads bowed, our eyes are closed, if this is the day you want to join this church, either by a statement letter or you need to be baptized, you say, preacher, I I need to follow the Lord in baptism. I've never done it. Or I've gotten saved. I confess Jesus, but I've never been baptized. Oh, today, confess it. Let one of these pastors uh, pray with you about how to do that. If you're here just a moment and you say, I've trusted Christ. I prayed it last week with you. I've just prayed it right now. I know I need to come forward. I know I need to take. Now, coming forward doesn't get you saved. Coming forward doesn't get you anything. But to the next step, which is we want to pray and encourage you. But if you make that decision for Jesus Christ, you need a helper. You need a mentor. You need someone to help you start. And that's why it's important to confess your sins. But I ask one last question, and then we're going to close for the morning. 
How many of you are burdened for a family member or a friend this Christmas season that they need to see a turnaround? They really need to see something happen. Would you just lift your hand and let me see who we're talking about? All right. Oh, so, so many. So, so many. Why don't we just pray for them right now? Why don't we fill this altar up and begin to pray and intercede? Maybe this is your first time here and you say, man, I, I've never been to a church like this. Listen, we want you to be back next week. We want you to come and enjoy this journey with us. We want you to feel free to do that. But make sure before you walk out these doors that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you need to come and pray, you need to come and, and tell someone, I just got saved, I need to be baptized, then you come right now. This altar is open for you. Just as I am waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to and we thank you for your grace it's sufficient we thank you that as we look at this season uh, I pray that as we go back to our homes and we see our trees we see presents we see the food that we'll share and we see the love that's being expressed how you bless that I pray but Lord I pray that we'll also have eyes to see someone this week that we could bless in a way that only you can know and that we would follow you in it I pray that you'll honor all the prayers that have been prayed this morning. And if any have asked uh, you into their heart, I pray that you'll give them uh, that dynamite conviction to move forward with you. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.